Welcome, everybody. This is the inaugural podcast of Dishwasher Diaries, where we discuss all subjects, integral, tangential, and most of the time, utterly irrelevant to the controversial topic of loading your dishwasher. Uh, believe it or not, uh, this all started on Clubhouse, the social audio site. A conversation was going on about people who are obsessed with the right way to load a dishwasher. I joined that conversation. Next thing you know, I opened a room about it. And for the next 189 days in a row, without missing a single day, we had conversations with people from all over the world about how they load their dishwasher and the arguments they have with other people in their household about the right way to load a dishwasher and all things integral and tangential there too. We even met some people who don't have dishwashers. Uh, they're human dishwashers and we talked to them about how they wash their dishes. We've talked for a while about turning this into a podcast where we continue to talk to everyday people about that subject and whatever else comes up, and also to talk about somewhat more well-known folks and more accomplished folks in the public eye about that very same subject. And our special guest today, the absolutely positively only person that could be the guest for the first episode of Dishwasher Diaries is Jenny Lumet, and we'll welcome her in a few minutes and explain why she is absolutely, positively the only person who could be the first guest. We'll also meet some of our friends who I've met on this journey of talking about loading your dishwasher. But before we do any of that, we've got a little theme song for you. Do you wash by hand or by machine? Do you rinse your dish or do you leave it in the sink soaking? Dishwasher queries for people all over the world. Bring your questions then. Come and meet my friends, Dishwasher Diaries. Now have you ever cleaned out your food trap? Nope. I have you ever researched all the brands of the product you're using? We will investigate. The best way to dry your plates. Bring your questions there. Come and meet my friends. Dishwasher Diaries. Dishwasher Diaries. Welcome, 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 everybody. So yes, that believe it or old. not, never gets old. I love that song. The writer and performer of that song, Brother Sam Lange, is here with us today. And we'll, we'll get a chance to chat with him a little later. That is the second greatest song ever written right behind Somewhere Over the Rainbow. Um, I love that song. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, I spent over half a year talking to people every day about how they load, how they load their dishwasher. And what we discovered, I think, together is that it's an amazing icebreaker. It's not as trite as the weather or if you live in L.A., the traffic or maybe the hometown sports team. But it's also not as touchy as politics, religion and all those other hot button topics we're not supposed to talk about when we're first getting to know someone. And we've discovered that it's a way to build rapport. It's something everyone can relate to. If they don't have a dishwasher, 
they still wash their dishes or somebody in their household does. And it has unlocked conversations into subjects that are somewhat related and subjects that are utterly unrelated. Uh, in the year plus that we've been having these conversations, I've learned about freezing my blue jeans to keep them from getting bacteria. I've learned how to install a dishwasher. I have learned all sorts of things about amazing things. The science of plastic containers in your dishwasher and what happens to them. And in case it's not obvious, needless to say, or maybe not needless to say, because I'm about to say it, I, when this started, knew no more about a dishwasher than how to turn it on. I am not an expert on dishwashers or kitchen appliances or washing your dishes. I've learned a lot because when something comes up, we do the research and we find out. We do actually talk about dishwashers, but of course, it's just a way of getting to know people and then talking about other things. So before we bring on Jenny, uh, I guess since it's the first episode, I wanted to tell you a little bit about myself. And later on, we're gonna meet some of what I call the Dishwasher Diaries gang, which are the wonderful people that I have met and gotten to know quite well through this journey uh, prior to turning this into a podcast. Uh, we have, many of us have met in person. We even had a weekend together where we all rented a house and spent a whole weekend together. And, and many of these folks have become, you know, really good friends. But by way of background, again, I don't know Jack about dishwashers other than what I've learned in the last year and a bit. Uh, I am a film producer by trade. Uh, I've had a rather episodic career. I've done a lot of different things in my life. I uh, grew up in Margate, New Jersey, right outside of Atlantic City. My father was in the nightclub business and then became an auctioneer on the boardwalk in Atlantic City. Uh, as a young kid, I moved to Las Vegas. I lived there for a couple of years, then to Laguna, then to Los Angeles, where I lived since I was 12. Uh, I went to USC film school and then I worked in advertising for a bit. And then I went back to law school at the University of Chicago. Uh, after law school, I was a law clerk, uh, first for a federal judge on what's called the, U, uh, the US Court of Appeals for the DC Circuit, a wonderful, wonderful man named Ab Mikva, who officiated at my wedding. But more importantly, uh, he was a congressman, then he became a federal judge, eventually the chief judge of the DC circuit, which is the court right below the Supreme Court. And then he was White House counsel for President Clinton, one of those rare people to serve at a very high level in all three branches of the federal government. After I clerked for Judge Mikva, I clerked on the Supreme Court for two justices, uh, retired Justice Brennan, who had retired by the time I got there. And I also spent half of my time working uh, for one of the active justices, justices uh, Justice David Souter. Uh, I thought I was gonna become a Washington lawyer, but the sort of film business called me back. So after clerking for two years in Washington, DC, I came to Los Angeles and became an entertainment lawyer. I was a talent lawyer for uh, a few years at a very prominent firm that represented some really, really well-known film directors and writers and actors and others, including Steven Spielberg, Clint Eastwood, Bob Zemeckis, and many others. Um, and then I went to Village Roadshow Pictures. Initially, I was the head of business and legal affairs, a position that I was woefully unqualified for. And then eventually I became the president of the company. I was at Village Roadshow for 10 years. We co-produced most of our movies with Warner Brothers. Uh, we are the people who brought you along with Warner Brothers movies, including the Matrix trilogy, Ocean's Eleven and the other Ocean's films, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, Training Day, Mystic River, uh, Happy Feet, lots of pretty darn good movies. We are also the people who brought you The Adventures of Pluto Nash, Catwoman, uh, Torque, 
So uh, they weren't all and winners. I think that's that's, that's what gave a little you the, background about That's me. what gave you the humility to be able to talk about dishwashers was Pluto Nash. Oh, man. Pluto Nash. Pluto Nash was such a financial disaster that there was a story about it in the Wall Street Journal. Not something I'm terribly, terribly proud of. Um, I'll just say it, the, the, the upshot of that whole thing is that, yeah, Steve's... Um, <laughs> Steve, you're kind of a big deal. And yet still, you wash dishes just like the rest of us. Not only do I do, I, do, I, uh, do dishes like the rest of us. I, I mean, I didn't tell the whole story of, of that fateful day, what I refer to as day zero. Uh, and then the following day became day one of, of Dishwasher Diaries. I was listening on Clubhouse. I had just gotten my second... Uh, vax for COVID and um, they were talking about loading your dishwasher and someone was talking about how they were having a conversation with their brand new wife. They were on their honeymoon about the proper way to load a dishwasher. He was an engineer and he realized that this was going to be a potential source of disagreement between him and his new wife. He had a very clear idea about the right way to load a dishwasher, how to fit things in, the way they should be positioned. His wife was not quite so buttoned down about it. And this totally resonated with me. I rearrange when other people load the dishwasher. I have very clear ideas about the right way to load a dishwasher. And so I raised my hand and went on stage and started talking about it. One thing led to another. I joked about opening a room the next day just to talk about how people load their dishwasher. I did that. I think we christened it Dishwasher Diaries maybe two or three days later. And as I said, it, it went on for over six months, every day, seven days a week, without missing a single day. So Jen, Jen and Hi. Welcome, first of all, Jenny Lumet. I, you didn't hear me say this. Literally, you are the only person in the world who could be the first guest on this podcast. We have been talking Frozen. over a half a year, every single day, about loading your dishwasher. And you of course, wrote this wonderful, wonderful, wonderful movie, Rachel Getting Married, that features a scene that is a dishwasher loading contest between the groom. The, the movie, of course, is about a wedding weekend. It's a wonderful film. And you have this dishwasher loading scene between the groom and the father of the bride. Tell us about that. Um, that... <laughs> that actually happened, but it didn't happen in that way. It happened when I was um, it happened when I was a little girl. I was probably about ten years old, and there's very fancy people in this story. But um, we were in our house on Long Island, and we had dinner guests, and it was my dad, and it was Bob Fosse, and his family, and his daughter Nicole, and um, you know. Bob Fosse is a very, very elegant guy. He was a very, very elegant guy, and he was in these black cashmere pants and this black cashmere sweater with a black cashmere sweater over, draped over his sweater. And my dad was in, like, you know, like a swag bag sweatsuit with, like, vinaigrette stains on his stomach, because he was his big stomach. And, um, but my dad was always dishwasher obsessed, always dishwasher obsessed. So we, I'm sitting there and I leave the table because it's all grown ups and it's boring and I go into the kitchen and I'm sitting on the stool by the phone. I had this beagle, this very old smelly beagle that was on the floor next with the, at my feet. And so dad comes in and all he doesn't care about his guests and he starts loading the dishwasher. And then Bob comes in and he's got the cigarette, you know, and he goes, you know, Sydney, if you put the salad bowls in sideways, you can get about 20% more. <laughs> All right, and Bob Fosse's smoke looks like Bob Fosse's smoke, right? And so Dad, uh, who's half a head shorter and certainly rounder, is like, go fuck yourself, Bob. And then the two of them just started, you know, doing it. But they're, it was just funny because they were both um, 
they were army guys, so maybe they're both in World War II guys. So maybe it's I have no freaking idea where it came from. But these two guys who you would think had better stuff to talk about just spent the rest of the night loading and unloading the dishwasher. And I just I, I didn't think, wow, this is some great fodder for some narrative. You know, I just thought it was weird. I was ten. Thinking Jenny, was, if like, there's any if there's anything we've discovered seriously. It's unbelievable how many people have a strong opinion about this. They get in arguments about it. People rearrange what other people do. This is, this is not unusual. I mean, the fact that it was Sidney Lumet, by the way, one of my all time, all time, all time, all time favorite film directors ever. And Bob Fosse, uh, another, you know, extraordinary artist just makes it better. And you, you were 10. I was, yeah, I was about 10. I had to, and, yeah, I was about 10. And did you, did the story just come back to you when you started writing Rachel Getting Married? Or is it a story you told in the no. intervening years? No, it's a story that came back to me when I was writing Rachel Getting Married. Um, because I, uh, it was funny. Uh, when I was, I was writing it and so I can't remember who came up and it wasn't, like, I was at home and I was with my, I know, I was, I was a, a, like, I think I was a stay at home mom at the time or maybe I was teaching I, at the time. I can't remember anything because of COVID brain. Um, but I was writing it and somebody said to me, you know, do you, how many set pieces do you have? It wasn't a movie person because I didn't, I didn't have any representation or anything like that. And I didn't know what exactly what a set piece was. So I called about, I asked my dad, I asked three people. I asked Mark Platt. I asked Mark Platt? No, because it had to have been before. Um, I asked like three people and one of them was Milos Forman and nobody could tell me exactly what a set piece was. And then months and months later, Jonathan Demi said, he didn't know, but if you had three of them, you got financing. And I was like, okay. <laughs> um, so the, the, it, it, it's the equivalent of a set piece, I guess, in that, in that movie. Um, uh, but I think not knowing that that's what it was made it more fun to watch or certainly more fun to write. Um, but no, I'd never told that story before. And it just struck me as very, I don't know, there's these two guys. I mean, like, I guess the late, the, ladies or the women at the table have been loading fucking dishwashers all their lives and the guys were like oh this is a novelty and i have a way whatever but um we were just <laughs> i'm pretty sure all the women at the table were like knock yourselves out guys i think there is definitely a small or maybe a little bigger than small mansplaining aspect to this i have discovered i really do believe it, it, it not like women can't be obsessed about this too but I've come to the conclusion that men are more often the ones who have very strict rules about the right way to load a dishwasher. At least that's the con that's my tentative conclusion. Yeah. I want to come back to Rachel getting married for one more sec. Yeah. The scene, obviously, the reason I wanted to have you here is because, you know, the trigger was that scene. But it's not just the dishwasher loading. I mean, the end of that scene is just one of the most poignant moments in the movie it's just it's so beautiful you know the big switch you make from that being you know really one of the lightest funnest scenes in what is a very very deep film to you know turning on the plate and it's such a beautiful moment thank you um i always well if you have a kid you have a plate even if you don't have a kid you have a plate but there's always something in the house um, that fucks you up. I don't know. I always think, and I don't like to get too heady and talk about this stuff like I know what I'm talking about, because I do to a certain extent. But you know writers, and they'll talk like they know, like, I know narrative structure. I don't know. You're just, okay. Um, what I do know, just from being an old broad and living in this world, is that the real life stuff happens when you don't have any time to prepare and it's never the big, huge event, it's always the little tiny thing. Um, and what could, I don't know, that movie I think was very much about breaking moments, if that makes any sense. There are these moments and they get broken. There are moments and they get broken, perhaps by the past. Um, you're, 
doing your thing and then the past comes up and hits you in the head like that, which mm -hmm. is pretty much what happens all the time. Yeah. Um, and this is, I'm saying this now, when I was writing it, I had absolutely no idea. Yeah, sure. Well, before, and, I, I, I want to dwell for a minute on your childhood. You mentioned this happened when you were 10. I mean, in addition to dinner parties with, you know, your dad and people like Bob Fosse. They were not parties. They were just dinners. Just dinners. Thank you for that correction. Not a, heavy, uh, not a formal family. You grew up in a family of, you know, sort of amazing artists, intellectuals. Your grandmother, of course, for those who don't know, uh, was Lena Horne. I mean, the legendary singer, actress, dancer, activist. In fact, there's a personal connection there. You know, I grew up in Atlantic City and my dad worked at the 500 Club. The two famous clubs in Atlantic City were Club Harlem and the 500. I'm, I'm guessing your grandma played both of them. I know she played Club Harlem a lot. I suspect she probably played the 500 as well, but I'm not sure. Your dad, of course, is Sidney Lumet. Your mom, Gail, is a journalist, an author, what was it like to grow up around these kinds of artists and thinkers? I mean, was this, did you feel just steeped in that or were you just another girl growing up? <laughs> well, um, if, oh, hold on. I have a, it's on my desk. And my mom would be really happy because it feels like a plug. But, okay, I'll pull up a book. Um, a book. Okay, so this is, this is not a plug, it just happens to be in my desk. All right, this is my mom's book. I don't know if you can see it. It's called The Horns in American Family. And uh, my grandmother's mother, Edna, was in the... Um, her father, Teddy, was a gangster, but her, her grandma and her grandmother... Um, I mean, her mother, Edna Scotchman, uh, was a aspiring star and she wanted to, she, she sang and danced in the tent shows in the deep south. And this is all just a little after reconstruction. So we've been, my son is an actor and he's in um, the off run. The off -run. He's wonderful. He's yeah. terrific. I have to tell you, I've been very busy on Paramount Plus. Very busy. Been watching Paramount. your current show and watching your son on the offer. I've been spending a lot of time on Paramount Plus the last couple of weeks. Yeah, I'm glad. Thank you. Um, so my son is the fifth generation. I mean, we've been doing this for a hundred and a hundred years, about a hundred years. Um, so it doesn't, whatever it is that you're steeped in, you don't know you're steeped in it. Um, I, you know, you're a kid and you do kid things and you really want to go watch Charlie's Angels or whatever and all the grown-ups are like this and then you fall asleep on the coats and it was a different time. Um, there was no such thing as helicopter parenting. You know, they were all like, where's the kid? I don't know. Nobody, nobody fucking knew. Oh, hi. My dog just came in the room. Um, so you're not, what you are, what, what I was steeped in and I, maybe it's an East Coast thing. I don't know. And I don't want to be disrespectful to West Coast movie families, but, um, it, we were from, I mean, dad was four and he was on stage in the Yiddish theater. And so, and grandma was on stage at the Cotton Club when she was like 16 or whatever. And then Edna was on stage. And so it's all, these are theater people, which is a little bit different from movie people. Yeah. Um, that said, the folk who were, and everybody was a friend, uh, Obviously, Bob Fosse was friends, where was a friend, and um, had a wonderful daughter, Nicole, and the one extraordinary Gwen Verdon. And um, I don't know, do you know Amanda Green? Do you know Amanda Green? I do not. Amanda Green, she's amazing. She just got nominated for her second or third Tony Award. And she is the child of Adolph Green, who with Betty Compton, Singing in the Rain. Uh, so, and Amanda and I are, have been friends since we were born because our parents were friends since we were born. So it was all, everybody who was around, yep. they were, it was not a, it was, everybody was a worker. Like everybody thought it wasn't particularly glamorous. Everybody just sort of got up and did it. Um, and that was the vibe. 
it was uh, it wasn't particularly it didn't feel glamorous. It might have seemed glamorous, but all everybody did was say, "Oh God, I gotta get up and I got this and who's doing that?" And then, but then it was screaming and yelling and making inappropriate jokes. <laughs> so that's really what it. That's really what it was. It felt very like a wonderful community more yep. than people saying smart shit. It was mostly a lot of screaming and yelling and Chinese food. <laughs> that sounds somewhat familiar. My parents also from Philadelphia, uh, like your dad. Um, so I want to jump forward to Star Trek. I mean, obviously, you know, you have the, the new show that you're the co-creator of, executive producer, um, uh, too. But you, you've been with Star Trek for a while. When you, when you first got involved, I mean, right, it's such a long-running franchise. The fan base is so unique, along with maybe just one or two other entertainment properties really in the history of American pop culture. Was that daunting in any way because it was Star Trek and not just some original show that you were working on? Did that, did that make it different for you? No, I mean, there are two things to say about that. One is, um, again, school teacher, and I love form. I love sonnets and haikus. I think that if you have a really deep structure um, it illumin it can illuminate the emotional stuff that's going on. Um, I love structure. Uh, so writing within that, and I fucked up a bunch of times, and then people like, you know, the department of you fucked up Star Trek calls you before it goes before and says, you fucked it up, yes, the job. That's a little scary. No, it's it's great. It's great because you it's um, you know, there's a whole bunch of folk who say, no, no, that can't happen because in DS9, this happened. You're like, okay, and then you figure out. Um, but Star Trek was a particular, it was a choice for a lot of reasons. I wrote Rachel, and then I had two other, uh, two other screenplays, both of which had uh, black ladies as the, black women as the protagonist, and I couldn't get them made. And there is perhaps a world where there were where they were terrible screenplays that were really poorly written. Um, but that so I figured, okay, I'll maybe should learn some stuff. So I did a lot of doctoring other people's stuff and 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 uh, and when I met Alex Kurtzman, I realized holy shit, he's the only well, he's one of the few people who have black women first on TV. I mean, he had Sleepy Hollow and I was a consultant on Sleepy Hollow. And then with disco, you have the extraordinary Sinequa Martin Green who deserves all the love in the world. And I thought, this is great. I get to write shows about black women. And that's really how I stepped into Star Trek. And do you feel, I want to talk a little bit about not only your career as a black woman in Hollywood, but also black women on the screen, not just behind it. it. A lot of people say this feels like a moment, but it's not the first time I've heard people say that. Do you feel like this is a moment where representation of black women, of other groups and individuals that have traditionally been underrepresented in film, in television, is this a moment or is well, this just... I wrote a piece about this called um, Will Woke Go Up in Smoke? <laughs> and um, my dog just heard that and left the room. And sure, don't growl. Don't go. Don't, maybe it's the clan. Maybe it's the clan here in Santa Monica and I got to get my clan back. Hold on. Get the <laughs> um, um. Oh, sorry. Let me shut the door, okay? Sorry, viewers. I'm going no to... Worries. What's your dog's name? Huh? What's your dog's name? Oh, her name is Solar. And she's the Solar. first non-rescue. She was a COVID. My daughter wanted a dog at COVID. First non-rescue dog. That dog is larcenous as fuck. This dog will steal the <laughs> I don't trust this fucking dog for a minute. Um, is this a sure? I'm going to say it's a moment. I mean, she's freaking out. Sorry if you can hear her. Oh, good. Um, you, you're coming through loud and clear. Oh, cool. Okay. 
I, of course, am optimistic because I don't think believe in being pessimistic. I think that's a, a disservice to those who came before one. And those who came before one, um, oh, she's really freaking out. Uh, those who came before me in my actual family, whose DNA I share, um, I'm the result of all their work. Mm -hmm. So is this a moment? Here's what I'll say, and it'll earn me a lot of hate mail, but fortunately I'm not really on social media. So haha. -ha. I think it the normalization of non-Caucasian faces on screen, there may be progress in that direction. Mm -hmm. I don't know, man. I mean, you see, I don't know if we should measure our, our industry by awards shows, but um, who knows? Maybe. I, I would ask, here's a question. I would ask, is this a moment not for black people, but for white people to look at themselves and say, wait a minute, have I been part of this system? Because the question of this moment for black people, uh, how about a moment for white people to in, think about what it's been like? Because yep. I know what it's been like. We know what it's been like. Um, so do white folk know what it's been like? And again, my dad's a white folk. Yep. Um, so uh, I think that's the question. Is this a moment of acknowledgement and realization and understanding for, for white folk as opposed to yet another thing for black women to do? Because we do a lot of shit. Um, so that's what I, that's why I, I counter you with that. Yeah. I, 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 and, and in response to that, like one thought that occurs to me, right? I, I often will hear people say, white people and black people or from whatever underrepresented group, they'll say, th there'll be an idea like, well, you know, what I really want to see is stories where all of those people who have traditionally been marginalized and underrepresented, represented, but where it's irrelevant that Right. It, it, it's not important that they're black. It's not important that they're gay. It's not important, whatever it is. And I always say, yeah, I want to see those. But I also want to see stories where it is important because, well, I mean, they're all human beings. I mean, it's relevant that right. All of that stuff about what their identity is, is often relevant. So I, I don't want to just get to a place where it's like, oh, it's just the Hispanic cop and the gay bartender, but also stories that are about that lived experience. And oh, go ahead. Oh, well, um, Man Who Fell to Earth is my show, and which is on Showtime. And Man Who Fell to Earth, I'm extraordinary, extraordinarily proud of this show. And I'm extraordinary, extraordinarily proud of the response to this show. And uh, most of the response to this show has been uh, these are, it doesn't lead with race, with the understanding that you're, that you're, you are talking about the importance of seeing a lived experience. Absolutely. Um, but I will also counter a lot of the shows that are based in the other, uh, the LGP, LGBTQIA, am I forgetting? I'm sorry. That's good. Um, we're going with that. Okay. I, I don't want to not embrace anybody. Um, uh, and certainly the black and brown community. Often the shows that we see about the lived experience of those folk are trauma based and they're trauma porn. And that pisses me off. I often think that if you somehow are othered, if you need to have a movie made about you, you somebody's got to, you've got to show, if you want to have a movie or a television series that's about you, there has to, there's some kind of weird punitive element, like somebody's getting their ass beat. I keep thinking about uh, For Color Girls, and I keep thinking about, you know, the, the movie, uh, What's Love Got to Do With It? And yep. you think about the, the story about, 
Matthew Shepard and you think about Cabaret and you think about the Cabaret, maybe that's not the same thing. Um, but the leaning into the, I, I don't think, I don't think that, and I know that you're not saying this, but I don't think that the price that marginalized people should have to pay for representation is to get, be getting, be getting their ass beat. Yep. Um, uh, yeah. I mean, look what's going on in the Star Wars world, man. It's crazy. And because nobody's getting their ass beat on screen, like the entire internet. Yeah, it's madness. It's madness. So um, with the understanding that this is a life and you should know about this life and it is on this, this life is on this earth and it's as beautiful as yours. Right? Right on. Right on, 100%. Right on, 100%. Um, in the same place as that, I very much believe, and that's very much what we, do, what we did with Man Who Fell to Earth. It's not, though, what it means to be a black family is in every single frame, in every single second of that movie, we don't lead with, with uh, trauma. Yep. Um, yeah, the tell Edge of Four is, is just amazing. Thing. I think, I mean, Naomi is killing it. And it's funny because totally. she's, she's, you know, she doesn't have the flashier part, but without Naomi, if you don't buy into Naomi, and why wouldn't you? Um, but yeah, but it's pretty amazing. What's your view of the current state of the Me Too movement and where it's at? Are, are you comfortable talking about that or would you rather absolutely, skip? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and I'm also comfortable talking about what happens after you do something, you out, so you Me Too somebody, 100%. Right on. Um, and what happens after is that people from high school call you and they really want to take you to lunch. It's the fucking weirdest thing. So there's the people who want to kill you. Um, I know. The people who are like, get the death threats and I want to kill you and all that stuff. And then there's the people from high school who are suddenly really concerned. And that's what I mean by trauma porn. Mm. It's like, it's, it's sort of sexy to some people. Um, here's, you know, it's funny. You're talking about... People seem to have their all, they're all in a tizzy about cancel culture and as a result of Me Too. And I don't think cancel culture exists because all the people screaming about being canceled are people with huge platforms. <laughs> so I'm like, wait, I'm sorry, what's the problem? You're, you're fine, folk. Everybody, all you folk who are upset, you're all doing your shows on Netflix and HBO and you got your comedy tours and where you got your, you know, your podcast reached by millions. So uh, nobody's actually been canceled. If you mean that people got arrested, well, that's pretty much on them. Right, or arrested, fired, ostracized by certain or lots of people in their personal life. Those all seem like appropriate consequences to, to behavior. horrible you, and illegal behavior. Absolutely, if you feel like you lost your, lost something, because somebody said something about you, then I think that your problem is with perhaps you say, for example, you work at Kodak and, uh, and you lose your job. Um, then perhaps your issue is with Kodak. Um, not with women, not with, uh, uh, sur sort of survivors all over the world. Um, oh wait, man, hold on. I've got COVID brain. So I said something right before. What did I, I can't remember. Oh, Me Too. Me Too, started by Tarana Burke, is in great, great shape. There are two Me Too's. There's the Tarana Burke Me Too. Um, she started it to combat sexual violence uh, towards black and brown women. And then there's the thing that happened in 2017, all of which is great. Tarana Burke's Me Too is going strong. And she's... She flies around the world educating people, and uh, we're lucky to have her. So the the uh, the thing that happened, which is also great, I'm not sure what's going on in that world. I think if uh, if you're someone who makes it so another person can't earn their living. Um, 
uh, in a civil workplace, then that's on you. Then that's on you. I'm not quite sure. I'm not quite sure how uh, the, the folk who, who scream loudest about being persecuted are the folk who've never really been persecuted. So I don't know. Yeah. No. I mean, you got me on our, like a you know, 70 Sam kind of morning, I got to say. I, no, <laughs> look, I think there's a theme to the things you were saying about the representation in the media, mm -hmm. in your projects, and this, which is, right, maybe it's a time for the people on the other side of that equation to be introspective about themselves rather than, you know, maybe the table just needs to be turned 180 degrees yeah. And and that's what it's really about. I think you're right. And again, I apologize for not sort of brief saying because you did send the things about what we could talk about or what no I wanted. Oh, I didn't. So um, my apologies to you. Um, and you caught me on a some morning, some rile, some morning, some not. Um, this is a rile morning. I'm glad we caught you on that morning. Huh? I'm it's glad we caught you on one of those. Lively conversation. Um, I. I, I get, I've started, you know, I'm, the next thing that I'm writing about is I'm writing, I have a show, another show uh, that for Showtime about my grandma. Awesome. And the amount of work that she had to do just sort of walking across the street. And I just, uh, You know, the discussion of is it a moment, a moment for whom to do what? Because I'm tired. Oh, my dog's tired. I'm tired. Um, so maybe it's a moment for the folk who aren't quite as tired in this way. And I hope you're going to, I'm glad I'm not on social media because I would have gotten a billion, billion things saying, I'm tired, I'm tired, I'm tired. And I get it. But there's this way of being tired, the way of carrying a, a way of representing an entire people every time you go get a sandwich. Um, so maybe it's, yeah, I think it's, will, will the folk who demand that, who demand that you represent everyone, realize that that's an unreasonable quest, an expectation? Right on. Well, yeah, listen. It, it would not be Dishwasher Diaries if I don't get to ask you a few questions about loading your dishwasher. Okay, but before you ask me a few questions about loading my dishwasher, why is this show called Dishwasher Diary? And what is your personal, I want to know this right now, what is your personal obsession or connection or just love, like a deep love for dishwashers? So Jenny, while we were trying to find you in the, in the vortex of Fireside, I, I told the following story. Okay, and I'm, it was so, hard. I couldn't figure it out. I feel bad. And I'm sorry. It's all we we love that you're here. Please. So, I was I during COVID. I spent a little more time than probably was rational on Clubhouse. This social right, audio I know app. Okay. And when I was sitting in the recovery room after getting my second COVID shot, mm -hmm. with my little earphones in, there was someone talking about he was on his honeymoon. And he and his new wife got into a conversation about loading the dishwasher. He was an engineer by training and he was worried this was going to be a source of conflict. He had very clear ideas. I raised my hand. I said, oh my gosh, I have this same disease. I will rearrange the dishes. I joked, I'm going to, tomorrow I'm going to open a room on Clubhouse and we're going to talk to people about how they load their dishwasher. Jenny, 189 <laughs> days in a row, seven days a week, I would talk to people. The conversation would start about how they load their dishwasher. And then we would talk about their marriages, their careers, politics, wow. the Supreme Court. And, and, and what I found was it was this bizarrely amazing icebreaker. I didn't do it as an icebreaker with you. I wanted to save it to the end where it's like, it's kind of like, instead of talking about the weather 
or talking about the hometown sports team or yeah. traffic on the 405. You ask people, do they put their forks in, handle up or handle down? Yeah. And the next thing you know, they're talking about the most personal things in their life. Yeah, well, That's that, how it started. Yeah, and that just happened tonight, just today. Um, okay, so are you asking me about my dishwasher? I'm gonna ask you. So first of all, are you the person in your household that is primarily responsible for loading your dishwasher? My daughter, who is 14, has become, that's become her job. Well um, done. It was previously my job. Okay. Um, I am not a particularly domesticated chick. <laughs> <laughs> when, when you were loading it, did, I mean, did you have a method? Is there, yeah. like, was there a particular place for everything? When I was loading my dishwasher, um, it was much more of an emotional exercise than a logistic or mathematical exercise. And it's interesting because thinking about your friend, the engineer, and also Bob Posse and Sidney Lumet, a choreographer, director, a director, director, and an engineer, it's all the same fucking person. Um, uh, order. And this will, and it's good. No, it's good. But mine were, my, stuff, my dishwasher loading stuff, or the things that I treasured more than life, yeah. they would always go on the top rack. Because usually there were small things, cups and mugs and plates. Right. Um, uh, cups and mugs and, and, and like cereal bowls, because for perfect cereal bowl is a great and beautiful thing. It's a great and fucking beautiful Ooh. thing. And I you have, have to have the right sort of angle to the oh side. My God. It's a, a cereal bowl. And it's, it's, it's significant because I'm a serial person. And also I have these glasses, the set of glasses that I got at Fish's Eddie 150 years ago called Heroes of the Torah. And there's a hero of the Torah on each glass. So those are sacred and they oh go in a little special place. Oh um, once you're down there with the, uh, your big ass plates and your knives and forks and pot and your pans, Just throw it in. Throw it in. But the, there's a sacredness to the things that I, oh, look, this milk pouring thing, which I have, I think it's a milk pouring thing, is shaped like a pink elephant. And that's really, so the things that I'm, a, <laughs> maybe I'm a, um, an animist, um, but the things that I actually have given some kind of consciousness to, yep. oh, crap. that might be a little more meta, than the engineer guy. <laughs> that is one of the, that, I'm seriously, uh, over a year of talking to people about how they load their dishwasher, we now have a unique Jenny Lumet thing about precious items. I don't, that's a new one. I love it. Did, when, you, when you handed this job off to your daughter, did you actually like say, okay, knives have to go in sharp side down, but leave the spoons eating side up because they'll get cleaner. Like, did you give her instructions? No, I said to, I explained the, the, the sacred things. I do. I, lo I still load the sacred things. Um, maybe when she's 16, we'll see. Um, <laughs> she is, happen I happen to have amazing kids and, uh, and not everybody has amazing kids. I'm really lucky. I mean, sometimes you actually know, you know that your kid's an asshole. And it's like, really, you can't say it, but you know it. You're like, God, um, I don't, I have really cool kids. I'm really happy about that. And she, she, it may be a tad haphazard, um, but she, I left her to her, to develop her own dishwasher journey as we all must. That is outstanding parenting. You're letting her make her own mistakes and have her own identity. Yes. With I little, love it. Little, with the little gel pods. Yes. That you I love it. Jenny, seriously, as I said at the top, there is no other person who could have been <laughs> the first person to do this with us. Well, I am so thankful and grateful continued success on everything you're doing. Uh, I'll keep watching your shows and whatever you do next. And 
your dad will forever. And we talk about film a lot on Dishwasher Diaries because I'm a film producer. Mm -hmm. I've said it a million times, truly just one of my favorite directors in the history of cinema. Thanks. And so it's, it's, that's a special treat for me too. He's, you know what? He's one of mine too. So thank you. Very Isn't much. that a great feeling? Isn't that a great feeling? Thank you so, so much for joining us. Mwah. Hey, Jenny, real quick. This is Chris, oh. the producer. Hi, Chris, I have a thank question. You. Do, do you have time for a couple of questions from the audience? Sure. Oh, thank you, Chris. And I think Chris has the first one. Yeah. I have a question for you, Star Trek related. Okay. I, okay. How do they handle their dishes on the Enterprise? Because I know they have a food replicator. What do they do with the dishes? <laughs> I have, I actually pitched this series to Alex Kurtzman, who's a wonderful guy, who you should have on this show. Um, and I said, who the fuck cleans the Enterprise? Who fucking cleans it? Because it's always like, where's the sparkling? Right? And I was like, those people, I want to know about those people. If you replicate the food, do you replicate the dish? Does the dish, you guys remember Willy Wonka when Mike TV became a million yes. different particular? So does that happen to the dish? I really don't know. And I think that, um, I have to write this down. And, and even it, and Jenny, even if you replicate the dish, when you replicate the food, you then eat it and digest it. You still have a dirty plate at the end, even if you replicated it. You got to do something with it. I'm actually writing this down to ask um, Alex. Who's oh, in I shock. love this. Star Trek. So Thank Chris, you, Jenny. You... Um, <laughs> it would seem wasteful. I don't know. How, it would seem. I gotta think about this because you <laughs> we've opened up a rabbit hole. You a really Star Trek it rabbit hole. And maybe they speaking up. Maybe they go through some portal to like the other freaking space and time enterprise where there are people are like scrubbing the dishes. We're like, damn, these people don't rinse or whatever just, it is. I don't know, but I'm gonna find out and just get back. Beam to them you. over to the Romulans. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know how they would be. Not to be an asshole, but I don't know how. I know. how. <laughs> I don't know, maybe, they, are, maybe they get all Greek wedding at the end of the and they're like, oh, that would be cool. All right, I'm gonna ask that too. Well, this we're now gonna have to do a follow-up conversation with Alan. Oh, and, yeah, maybe by, no, and maybe him. by then we'll have the answer to this question. He's gonna be all obsessed. Yeah. He can report back. Okay. We 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 have a few questions from the audience. I forgot to mention this at the outset, but I'm sure Chris has it totally in control. So if you have a question for Jenny, you have time for maybe three or four questions? No. Wonderful. Okay, I know, I know that Colin had a question and I know that Lisa had a question. Colin, would you like to go first? I saw you first. Hey, um, thanks, for, uh, thanks for doing this, Jenny. This was great. Oh, sure, sure. Thank you for having, I'm happy to be here. Oh, we're happy to have you. And, you know, me especially, because I'm a huge Star Trek fan. I grew up uh, going to conventions, Star Trek conventions when I was a kid, and uh, in Toronto, nevertheless. And, uh, and, and now it's really great to know that you guys are producing it over here. So, um, you know, I have a theory about the, uh, the dishes, because I had to research this. Um, you know, if they, if they reproduce the dishes, like, you know, Picard does and he, when he orders his Earl Grey at a certain temperature... <laughs> Uh, the, uh, the, the dishes have, I think they would be recycled because if you look at the international space station, when they do, when they have dishes on the international space station, it comes in these packaging and they throw away the dishes and the packages get recycled. So I think that's, that might be one way they go with it. But, um, I also wanted to ask you, I want to say thank you so much for having the Gorn uh on your on it's an i think it's a new alien species right well the gorn existed in tos oh yes that's right yes i forgot all about that um my question was actually in regards to uh rachel getting married um you know some of the character names for example sydney is uh harkens back to your dad and, and i think the that buckman was, that his sorry. original name was mick and uh Tunde Evanbe, who played that character, requested the name change, and I was. Oh. 
And and Buckman uh, kind of seems similar to your your mom Buckley. Were there any other draws from your own experience in the script? Well, mom's actually a Jones. Buckley was her married name. Uh, she was Gail. There we go. Gail Jones Lumet Buckley. Um, no, Buckman. Honestly, for names, because names for for me, other writers may not feel this way. I feel the most self conscious when I'm making up names. So I usually, when there was a phone book, I usually just open a phone book and go like that, for <laughs> real. Um, or I, if I, go, if or I Google now um, most common surnames in X, and I pick one, so I don't feel like I'm making a total pretend like TV name. You know, like 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 uh, what? What's a really like dash sled boat or whatever it is that they. <laughs> <laughs> and those drive me crazy, like those TV names. It's just like, why do they do that? Why? I don't know. Just go in the phone book. Just go in the phone book right now. I, you know, I, you can look at your Amazon package and be like, oh, this person is named, I don't know, carrier requested. I don't know. But just, just like find something real. Find something real. No one's going to see you. It's fine. Exactly. Well, the names are very natural. Thanks for giving us that movie, by the way. Thanks, Colin. Chris, who do we have next? And I, we have Lisa. Lisa actually has a question uh, more on the, um, the theater side of things. Oh. Oh, that was really shocking, right? That my question would be around, <laughs> around theater. And, and by the way, Jenny, I just want to mention, the reason why we know all these people, the folks who are asking you these questions are, are people that I call the Dishwasher Diaries gang who have been there with me having these conversations for the last year. So wow. we've all gotten to know each other quite well. <laughs> Go ahead, Lisa. Yeah, I was gonna say, we, we, there were many times we were talking about being able to have a conversation with you. So this is super exciting. Um, so yeah, I'm a New Yorker. I'm a big theater enthusiast. And um, I was really excited about the news last week, I think, or the week before that there's going to be, they're renaming one of the theaters for Lena Horn. I was wondering, I just want to say, woohoo, I'm very excited about that, Rep, you know, representation. Um, and I just wondered if you had anything to do with that. Are you going to be part of that celebration? Can you tell us anything about that? And just I'm very excited about it. There's an organization called Black Theater United that is, I believe, that was founded, I believe, I believe, I do not want to get this wrong. I don't want to leave anybody out. So this is, I believe, by Audra McDonald and Billy Porter. And they, along with other folk whose name I don't know, I'm sorry, um, gathered the biggest landlords, Jujamson, Niederlander, and there's a third, name's escaping me right now, um, sorry, uh, and said, listen, you have to, you have to, because there's not a single, there are, you know, there's the August Wilson Theater, but everybody else, everything else is also, by, is named after, all, every other space is named also by people who might not have made the contribution that these artists have. Um, so the Brooks Atkinson Theater is about, going to be renamed in the fall the Lena Horn Theater. Brooks Atkinson, when my grandmother was um, singing in a show called Blackbirds of 1939, uh, was actually reviewed by Brooks Atkinson, who said the show was shit, but there was a, a sepia girl who will be a stunner once she gets the proper direction. Um, so I appreciate that Brooks Atkinson understood my grandma was amazing. And also, fuck him for calling her her the sepia girl, and now she kicked him out of the theater. So, Brooks, don't let the door hit you on the way out. That's uh, amazing. That's amazing. Thanks for I sharing the story. I, I, I knew that Niederlander was the last group to finally do this. I did not know the Brooks Atkinson story. That is absolutely amazing. I'm very grateful for the Nieder. I mean, however, you know, whoever, I'm grateful the, for the folks who nudged their, pushed the Niederlanders, and I'm grateful for the Niederlanders, to the Niederlanders for doing it. Because and that coalition is doing a lot of great work, so it's really great. Doing great stuff. They're doing okay. great stuff. No, thank you. Can I ask what kind do you guys um what kind of dishwashers you all have, and do you guys have like a rotten tomatoes of dishwashers? And <laughs> are you going to be releasing? Are you guys going to be like the blacklist of dishwashers? Um, and are you going to start filming folk or getting video of folk? It's kind of like porn. Like, this is how I load. Jenny, like, you're, pro you're producing our podcast for us. I love this. You know, I we, 
Sorry, but it'd be great. Like, I would love to see, like, how, um, like, Leah Delaria, like, how does she load her dishwasher? This is genius. So one of the things we're going to do is we're going to have a, a reporter in the field. We can even send her to people's houses. When I started this, I mean, Jenny, seriously, I knew how to turn on my dishwasher and I had some sort of bizarre fixation about the right way to pack it, but I don't know shit about dishwashers. But people would see that it was dishwasher diaries. We've had people, one day someone said, can you put your Tupperware in the dishwasher? Is it safe? Mm -hmm. We had a guy come in who was a plastics expert mm -hmm. and explain what happens when you put Tupperware in the dishwasher, why it might be safe, why it might not be. We, we had someone come on and say how you install a dishwasher, the S-curve. I now consider myself a summit expert on dishwashers. I know how many gallons of water they use. Oh, yes. So we're going to do all of that. We're going to do all of that. This is very exciting. Yes. No, no, no. I can see it. I can totally see you can see if we can get some Trek folk. Um, might be fun. I'll talk oh, about the, That would be amazing. Alex, you, the Star Trek cast. Oh, my God. Uh, you have time for maybe one or two more? Yeah, you know why? Because I'm procrastinating writing. Uh, well, <laughs> we're going we're gonna to age you in procrastinating just enough. Then we're going to let you go. Chris, who who we got next? Oh well, hold on a second. Then I thought we were out. Um, we've got a we've got a newcomer here. Um, uh, Chris, we will invite Chris up. Just one moment. He has a question. Yes, hello. Thank you very much. My name is Chris Rosetti in the city of San Francisco. Great interview. Great show. Great podcast. As a, as a non dishwasher owner, I want to say. Oh, shit. Give, stop, stop, stop. Hold my beer. What? You give me hope. Oh. My question is this. Do you use liquid or granulated powdered dishwashing soap? One of In the dishwasher, I use the little pods. The little pods that look like candy that children and dogs, toddlers and dogs would love to eat. Because I found that the granular leaves a residue on my hero of the Torah glass and my heroes of the Torah glasses. You cannot have residue on Moses and Joseph. This is no, unacceptable. You, you really can't. Um, in the sink, when I'm, you know, giving my 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 precious things the sink love, uh, it's usually the stuff that they use to wash baby ducks. What is that? You guys, there's all those commercials about how it's, 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 it's a dial, dove? No, not dove. Dawn. It's dawn. 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 The blue stuff. The blue stuff. Thank you for the information. See, Once Jenny, again, you're, thank you for giving you me could be a dish. You could be in the Dishwasher Diaries gang. You're starting to get into this. <laughs> Chris, thank you. Um, and I hope someday to boldly wash where no man has washed before. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. Mm -hmm. We have one more, Chris. We got a lot of folk named Chris. We we do. Everyone's I know named Chris. Is, apparently, yes. We. I'm only bringing Chris's on stage. No, that's okay. not true. We have an Andrea that is coming up next with a question. Okay, yeah. We go. Oh, invite yeah. to speak. Hello, Andrea. Hey, Andrea. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Wow, this is so exciting. Thank you so much. I am a massive uh, Dishwasher Diary fan, and this was a great first podcast. And Jenny, what a great interview. Thank you. My big question of the day, I totally agree with you, by the way, that this is a moment uh, also for white people. <laughs> so thank you for that reminder, and happy Juneteenth, everybody. I do want to say that I am very curious whether you use rinse aid in your dishwasher or whether you use... Uh, white vinegar as an alternative. White vinegar. Yeah. I'm fully committed uh, to white vinegar. Rinse aid uh, has vaguely terrifying connotations to me. It sounds like, it, I don't know. It, it, um, it, um, white vinegar, 100%. Rinse aid sounds like a product they would try to like make you use before they found out that like saccharin was bad for you. And I don't mean to diss the rinse aid people. Oh my God, am I going to get like letters? But no, white vinegar, 100%. I, okay, I first of all, I am dumbfounded that we are getting questions 
about your dishwashing regimen. No, I think it makes perfect sense. It, it, I guess it does in some. It, remember, you, you when I first contacted you, you said this is demented. I really don't understand how this happened. And now I, I have I have a habit of saying I really need to reevaluate my life choices. But this is a kind of validation that that, that you know there's something here. I mean, we are now getting into what fluids you are putting inside of your dishwasher. I think you need to get some couples, like couple, couple, like committed couples in here and they can find their, there's like some shit will go down. Oh yeah, we're gonna, we, when we were doing this on Clubhouse before we decided to start a podcast, we talked about a couple of interventions yeah, where yeah. one person would come on, they would talk about how horrible the fights were about loading the dishwasher and we would say, invite your partner on and we'll do an intervention. This is a safe space. You can both talk about it and we'll work through it with you. If anybody has your partner, any... huh? Or your mother-in-law. There have been a few of those. Yeah, I bet. I bet. Okay, one more. Our last question for Ms. Lumet. Okay, and then I have to go. I have a question, Ooh. if that works out. Cindy, diva. I, I want to introduce you. Cindy owns three dishwashers in her home and she never loads any of them. We call her our dishwasher diva. <laughs> I respect that. That's like a goal. Um, I will say, Jenny, that someone back channeled me while you were talking and said that we have a lot in common. <laughs> <laughs> so, and it's funny that you just said that, Steve, because my question and comment is relating to the uh, plurality of dishwashers that potentially are in your home and how it ties back to the story you have about your father and Bob Fosse. Um, how many dishwashers do you have and what do you think the optimal number is? <laughs> I think the optimal number, well, I have one. I think that, now this brings up a much bigger question because now you've opened up the world of marketing to where someone says here, at Restoration Hardware, <laughs> you have this dishwasher that is for your your ceramics or your this, and here you have, and that will be, you know how people have these refrigerators that are the size of like a VW bus? So people are gonna start to have multiple fridges for different, I feel it, I feel Wait, it. Coming. Hold on, hold on, doesn't everybody? I, oh, <laughs> you? I'm sorry, I feel bad now, I feel bad. Um, She's a diva. Uh, my, well, yeah, my optimal is one dishwasher, but one person to freaking do the dishes. <laughs> that isn't me. So that's, <laughs> that's yeah, that's what I got. <laughs> well, um, I, I like the second half of that because, yes, then it doesn't really matter how many dishwashers you have. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, because I was thinking, and I to me it was the main takeaway of your entire gorgeous interview, is that when your father, Sidley, Sidney Lumet, was being told by Bob Fosse that he needed to tilt his bowls just so to be able to make more room so he has more space for more dishes, I kept thinking to myself, well, it's a shame Sidney couldn't just say, I have three dishwashers, Bob. I don't need to do that. I have three. Well, Sidney, my papa, my pop. Um, he's a depression era kid. So every the three dishwashers would have been a wild, wild, what he, he would have said like, what are you, what? Who has, ridiculous. He would have said ridiculous. Not to be, not to disuse it, this is not a disc, but this is him, this is a depression era guy. And every single thing that we finished in our house or halfway finished food wise, he would wrap it in tin foil and put it in the freezer. And no matter what it was, <laughs> what it went in, when it came out, it was spaghetti sauce. I don't know how that happened. <laughs> but My was, mom called that concoction. Yeah, yeah. Everything, heels of bread, eggs. It's perfectly good. They last forever like that. Um, so it's a different vibe. He probably would be horrified that I, like I have, I have this fancy house in, in Los Angeles and I, I think I've opened the oven like nuns and and the refrigerator is really fancy and I'm not a particularly large person. So every morning I'm like, <laughs> I can't open the fucking thing. Um, uh, 
So he would probably be horrified that I usually order things and then throw away everything at the end of the meal. But, um, you know, we move on. Things change. Jenny never did, did a dish when she didn't have to. Have, have, have the audience will know why I'm asking this question. You may or may not. Have you ever put a pair of your own blue jeans in the freezer? Yeah. Of course. You put your blue jeans in the freezer or you get them dry clean because then you don't get the shrinkage. Um, but only, you know, only in times of absolute necessity. But that's how everybody got through COVID, thinking that they're, they didn't go up five sizes. Like, no, I'm still fitting into my jeans. It's because you haven't washed them since 2021. Hundred percent, Jenny. This your discussion of the appliances. You're wanting to ask us questions about our own dishwashers, your ideas about our podcast, and your answer to that last question have confirmed to me that th this was destiny. That I would find you, and you would agree to do this. You are, you are a member of the Dishwasher Diaries gang. This is extraordinary. Thank you. I, if there was ever a softball game against another podcast, I don't know how we would do. Would we do okay? I don't know. I'm going to be sitting there with Cindy, like drinking Diet Coke and not fucking running around the bases. So I don't know how we do. We'd have clean dishes, and that's all we really have. <laughs> Thank you so, so much. I'm all for bringing Alex on. That'd be awesome, too. I cannot thank you enough. We are honored and just over the moon to have had you. Well, Thank you. Good time. You guys got me out of my surly ass mood, so I'm thrilled. Thank you so much. Go write Thank some you, great stuff. Okay, I'll go write some great stuff. Right now. <laughs> Thank Thanks so much, Jenny. It was so great having you. Bye, guys. Bye bye. Am I still here? I don't even know. We'll we'll kick yeah. you out if you don't find your own way out. <laughs> <laughs> um. Oh my gosh, I love it. Jenny, well, let me Boy, find it. It was amazing. I'll get. I'll um, help you down to the audience. Be, so wow. Um, I don't know what to say. I'm I'm blown away by. I mean, the dishwasher story was enough, but it turns out Jenny's one of us. I mean, she actually wanted to ask us questions about our dishwashers. I love her. Yeah, she's amazing. She's she's she's, she's an official member of the team now. She is a member of, the, I mean, she's already contemplating our softball game against another podcast. This is our first episode and we already have a softball team as far as Jenny's concerned. I feel sorry for the next special guest because she's a hard act to follow. She is a really hard act to follow. So we're going to spend a few more minutes. Um, I do want to interview at least one or two of our audience members about loading their dishwasher to get back to uh, our roots. Um, but first, I mean, holy mackerel, that was amazing. Jenny Lumet is incredible, an incredible talent, an incredible family. She's smart, she's funny, she's profound. I just, that was incredible. Yeah, I love, I mean, love, love. We really couldn't have asked for somebody better. It was, as you said, it was, it was a match made in heaven. It really was. Um, so look, if you're, I know we have many of our friends here and as we continue these podcasts, uh, the, the whole dishwasher diaries gang will join me, uh, in conversation with each other and with other people we, uh, bring in. But I did want to end today by inviting at least one or two people who's never, who have never been here before to come up and let us have a conversation with them about how they load their dishwasher. Uh, and so if this is new to you, if you've never been in Dishwasher Diaries before, because even though this is our first podcast, we've been around for a while, uh, raise your hand and we'll have a short conversation with you about that. Uh, so yeah, let's do that. Uh, I assume Chris, someone has raised their hand. I hope so. I am looking and I see who has raised their hand. Let's look and see. Um, we've got, oh, we've got some familiar faces that have raised their hands. Familiar um, faces are good too. Okay. Let's look and see who I got here. Um, oh, well, we don't have familiar faces. There were some. Um, if you want to 
And we really, we encourage you to do this because this is how we initiate you into the madness is to raise your hand or just um, let me know that you want to come up and talk and we are going to ask you some dishwasher questions. Well, don't, Steve will ask you dishwasher questions. Don't be afraid. It's a safe space. And I do want to clarify. I do want to clarify. If you don't own a dishwasher, that's okay. We have dishwasher refuseniks. We have people who would love to have a dishwasher and just don't happen to have one. We've talked to people from all over the world, including in places where dish dishwashers are far less common than they are in other parts of the world. We'll talk to you about hand washing. Don't be afraid. And hey, if you can be there since day one and have never touched the dishwasher. That's fine too. Absolutely. And you can own three dishwashers and never have touched a dishwasher and come up. Not that that refers to anyone in particular who's here right now. We're going to bring back up our friend, Chris, with the glorious radio voice. And Chris, holy mackerel, dishwasher. that voice. Welcome, Chris. How are you? Well, thank you so much. Um, since I am new, although I've already asked a question, I do have two follow-up questions about dishwasher. You don't get to ask follow-up questions yet. First, tell me. I have a few questions for you. Where in the world are you? I'm in San Francisco, California. And are you the person in your household that is responsible for loading the dishwasher? We don't own a dishwasher, but I am the dishwasher. You are the hand washer. Excellent. And we have a whole different set of questions for hand washers. But first, I have to know, do you not have a dishwasher because you don't want one or just the place where you live didn't have one? Why isn't there a dishwasher? We live in 420 square feet and there's no room. The kitchen is so small. When I turn around, I turn the gas burners on with my rear end. <laughs> I get the picture. I get the picture. And you said you are the washer. Um, so first question, do you wash dishes after every meal or do they sort of accumulate in the sink until dishwashing time, maybe like at the end of the day? We have a two sided sink. So basically one side is left open at all times for the actual water and washing. The other side is left open for the actual dirty dishes. Once the dirty dish side has accumulated to the stack of approximately two to three and a half feet to wash the dishes. <laughs> okay, so I'm, I'm guessing you're exaggerating a little about the height of the stack, but seriously, is the accumulation of dirty dishes an issue for anyone else in, in the household? You're the, you're, the, you're the guy who washes the dishes. Is anyone else unhappy that you allow a rather large stack to accumulate before you get to wash it? Not at all. After 35 years of marriage, my wife is quite happy that someone else helps. Just the fact that you're doing it works for her. Exactly. And do you also do some or all of the cooking or is that the division of labor? One person's cooking and the other person's cleaning. I probably do 50% of the cooking. My wife does the other 50%. And also she does 90% of all baking. I do 90% uh, of all cooking rather than Man, baking. You got some stuff going on there. You got baking and cooking. This sounds good. And um, okay, so let's get into your technique a little. You mentioned two sides of the dish uh, of the sink. So it's time to wash the dirty dishes. Um, I assume before they went in the sink, they like they were scraped off maybe into the garbage can. Is that something you do? They were either scraped off if it's just the bare refuse or if there were uh, large portions, they were repackaged for later use. And if they were minuscule portions left over, they were repackaged in the freezer for later soups. A la, a la Sydney Lumet. I mean, that's a technique taken right out of the Lumet household. We learned exactly. just moments ago. Okay, so it's time to wash. Is the water running or do you like fill the sink with water? What, what's the technique? The technique is to separate the glasses and cups first. They are then done into the initial rinse, the water being about a quarter filled. And then once the glasses are done, we move on to the next set of utensils. Okay. It sounds like you're being pretty uh, mindful of not using too much water too. Exactly. We do have to pay the water bill. Well done. Well done. And, you know, maybe even being somewhat kind to the environment. Um, are you a towel dryer or are you a rack dryer? I'm a raconteur. I'm a rack dryer. <laughs> 
Okay, your rack. We we it, it, this is a G-rated show, but we do like to talk about people's racks. Uh, is it wood? Is it metal? What what does it look like? Oh, I think I might have stumped Chris with that one. What with the plastic? I lost Chris. I can't hear him. I'm here. I'm, Can you, I'm still oh, here. Oh, the other Chris. Yes. Sorry, we lost you for a second, Chris. What is it? A wood rack? A metal rack? A plastic rack? It's a plastic rack. Okay. My final question. It's all done. They're clean. They're dry. It sounds like this is all Chris. You also put them away. Incorrect. Oh, a little curveball at the end there. Who puts them away? Our daughter, our lovely daughter does. Ah, so the daughter for now anyway, doesn't have, it sounds like cooking responsibilities or dishwashing responsibilities, but she is the designated putter away. -er. Indubitably. I love it. Well, Chris, you are now part of the Dishwasher Diaries gang and you mentioned you had a couple of questions. Uh, I don't know if anyone else has questions for you before we let you ask your questions. Uh, is there anyone on stage who has a question for Chris? Chris, this is the other Chris. Are you a sponge washer or a cloth? Ooh, the age old sponge versus cloth question. Cloth washer with the explicit instructions from my wife that I change out the cloth at least every three loads of dishes. Ama this is amazing, Chris. You actually anticipated my follow-up question. Amazing. Chris, you said you had a couple questions for us. I'm a little afraid because we really know nothing, but go for it. Well, two questions. One is, as in dryer lore, washer and dryers for clothing, the dryers have what they call the missing sock phenomenon. The dishwashers have a missing utensil phenomenon. And then the follow-up question, or last question rather, um, have you ever tried cooking? I've seen videos where people cook in their dishwashers. Two amazing questions. Uh, so f let me take the second one first. Before we became a podcast, we took a deep dive into dishwasher cooking. It's unbelievable. People doing whole meals, fish, chicken, people doing uh, artisan drink in the dishwasher, creating like botanicals. It's insane the number of things you can do in a dishwasher. We also learned a somewhat less pleasantly than preparing a meal in your dishwasher. Several people have died in their dishwasher. For some reason that I haven't figured out, this seems to be a particularly Australian phenomenon. I think we found either two or three news stories of people falling into their dishwasher and getting impaled on something and dying. I think all three of them were in Australia. We haven't gotten to the bottom of why it is that this is always happening down under. Um, so we have seen a lot of the cooking. With regard to your lost utensil, I, I'm gonna invite others to speculate, but I have to tell you, there is one utensil in my household over the years, multiple households, that disappears with great regularity. I don't think it's disappearing from the dishwasher, of course, but they are disappearing. It is the salad fork, the smaller fork, which of course is not just used for salads, but it's often used by younger folks as their fork at a meal. And my working theory, I've discussed this with my children. My working theory is that on occasion, they simply get thrown out, that someone goes to the trash to scrape a dish or to, you know, get the refuse off a dish and they just kind of pour it in and they literally throw away the small fork because I still have all my knives. I still have all my big forks. I still got all my tablespoons, but I'm down to like 50% of the number of small forks that I started with. Chris, I don't know if you 
uh, Mr. Seacott, if you have another theory or if anyone else on stage does, but I'm, I'm losing the small forks and I think it's the kids. I mean, unless there's something more nefarious happening with this particular dishwasher that I don't know about. Um, I think it's just, I know people are, I, 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 we had a long discussion um, not too long ago at my sister's place about um, my brother-in-law not knowing which slot to put the like serving spoons in as opposed to the soup spoons. So we couldn't find soup spoons. And then we realized they were all in the serving spoon. They were there the so whole time. They were there it's, the whole time. So I think very... it could, yeah, I think it just, it could just be misplaced. That would be my guess. That's it. But it's an interesting question. And by the way, the socks, they're under the dryer and behind the washer and dryer. Why are people so confused about this? Just The socks do look. actually sometimes get sucked into the lint trap. Come on. I So having lived in, in, in apartments, I've had to have them come in from time to time, them being maintenance, and they'll pull off the front of the dryer. And every so often, not all the time, Incredible. but it gets sucked in through that exhaust if there's just a little bit of a space, it can pull an entire sock through there with the force. I'm, I'm dumbfounded I'm learning this for the first time. Yeah, so they do actually eat socks. It's not all the time, but it, it does happen. Amazing. Well, look, this is our first podcast. I think on our next installment, we're going to introduce many members of our Dishwasher Diaries gang. Uh we're new here in the podcast world, but we've been talking about this for over a year and uh, we've learned a lot of crazy things, but spread the word, join us every week. We'll have a new guest. Let's hope half of them are as wonderful as Jenny Lumet. When I thought I was out, they keep pulling me back. If you want to tune in live and actually participate in the conversation, Tell us about how you do the dishes. Ask a question of whoever our guest happens to be. You can join us on Fireside at Dishwasher Diaries. Thank you so, so, so much to Jenny Lumet. She was amazing. Chris Seacott, my producer. God bless you, Chris. The entire Dishwasher Diaries gang, thank you guys so much for being here. As I mentioned, if you stick with us on the podcast, you will get to know some of these folks. They are an interesting, funny, crazy, dishwasher obsessed group. And finally, a thanks to brother Sam Lange, who I know is with us today, and we will definitely be talking to him in future installments. He is the musical genius behind the second greatest song in the world, the Dishwasher Diaries theme song. He wrote it, he performs it, and we're gonna say goodbye by playing it for you one more time. Do you wash by hand or by machine? Do you rinse your dish or do you leave it in the sink soaking? I wash after every meal. Dishwasher queries from people all over the world. Bring your questions then. Come and meet my friends. Dishwasher diaries. I have you ever cleaned out your food trap still no i have you ever researched all the brands of the product you're using we will investigate the best way to dry your plates bring your questions there come and meet my friends Dishwasher Diaries. Everybody now. Dishwasher Diaries.
Take care, y'all. Can I see you soon? Can I? Di- I want to just say one quick thing that we haven't been able to say before. Dishwasher Diaries was recorded before a live studio audience. Created live on Fireside.